Very good evening to, to everybody here and a very warm welcome. Um, and I'm delighted to see you, sir, here this evening. Thank you very much for coming to the London Business School. Is this his first trip here? So I couldn't resist showing him the outside of the building just to let him know he was somewhere slightly different. Um, just to be completely clear, as far as I'm concerned, um, as a school, we are extremely interested in the story of the region, both in terms of, of Hong Kong, of course, and of China more generally. Um, and I was delighted to be in Hong Kong last month as part of the launch of our, our major fundraising campaign. Um, as a business school, you know, we are um, we're very conscious of the fact that certain economic forces shape the world. And I, I, when I was introducing something a couple of weeks ago, I said, you know, it seems to me if you looked at the way in which global stock markets react to events in the region, it is quite clear how important the region is. You just have to look at the way markets react. Um, if, you, if you think you're important, then just wait to see where the way the markets are moving when you have a piece of news. Um, in Hong Kong itself, of course, we've got our uh, program jointly with Hong Kong and with, with Colombia. Um, we, uh, we have one of our global business experiences in Hong Kong each year now with the students going there. Um, and I'm delighted we've got student exchange programs there with Hong Kong as well. Um, I'm also delighted that um, a lot of our alumni are very active in, in Hong Kong itself. As far as the region more generally is concerned, um, we are heavily involved in, in study tours, um, both to Beijing and, and Shanghai. Uh, and I'm delighted this our, our memorandum, memorandum of understanding with the State Administration of Foreign Exchange for, for their employees to come on our MIF program here is, I think, you know, it's, it's of real significance to us. And also, we are increasingly involved in, in executive education in the region. Our, our, we have a huge program, one week of which is in Switzerland and one week in, in China. Um, if I think about the way our, our alumni are, are active, if I think of, of Linda Ewer, who's the uh, BBC's now chief business correspondent, who used to be on the faculty here and was advised the Chinese government on their plans, and Namalia Kumar's uh, work involving brands from emerging economies and particularly interested in the Chinese side. Um, tonight we're going to learn about entrepreneurship and some of the things that you are going to tell us. Um, we have had here an increasing involvement and my colleague Rajesh Chandy is one of the, uh, one of the founders of our, uh, our Institute of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Um, we're proud that our business incubator is, is, has been so successful in nurturing businesses. Um, and so as far as we're concerned, this is something very central to our own hearts. Um, so in terms of um, uh, our guest this evening, uh, he joined the Hong Kong Civil Service in 1982 and was first part of the administrative service and later served on a number of, e a number of, e a number of different capacities, including Director General of the London Economic and Trade Office, Commissioner of Customs and Excise, and Permanent Secretary for Housing, Planning and Lands. And he was appointed Secretary for Commerce, Industry and Technology in 2003 and chaired the World Trade Organization Ministerial Conference in Hong Kong in 2005. He was then appointed Director of the Chief Executive Office and has been serving as Financial Secretary since 2007. Please join me in warmly welcoming Mr. Tsang Hia. Thank you very much, Sir Andrew. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, fellow students, good afternoon. It's indeed my great pleasure to be with you at the London Business School. First of all, a heartfelt thank you to the Asia Club for organizing this get together, and I thank you all for coming. I too have experienced the pressures of university life, albeit a long time ago. And so I really do appreciate that you are giving up valuable time, valuable study time to be here and join our discussions today on Hong Kong. I also suspect that uh, perhaps one or two of you may simply be here as an excuse to skip this afternoon's accounting <laughs> class. <laughs> well, for whatever your motivations are for coming, I can assure you that you won't be disappointed. While I cannot guarantee that you will find my talk any more interesting than scrutinizing profit and loss statements, but I can guarantee that Hong Kong does and Hong Kong will continue to offer exciting opportunities
for business and finance professionals from LBS and also from elsewhere around the world. Hong Kong's successful formula for business is relatively straightforward. It's a strategy that is based on low taxes, a strategy that's based on high efficiency, and a firm commitment to the rule of law. <clears throat> for us, low and simple tax means a top salaries tax rate of 15%, 1.5, calculated on a progressive scale. And we also have a flat profits tax fixed at 16.5%. Basically, the idea is that you will take home what you earn with a little bit to the government. And in Hong Kong, we have no capital gains tax, we have no inheritance tax, we have no VAT, we have no GST. And in 2008, I even managed to eliminate duties on wine and beer. <laughs> You're right in guessing that that was a rather popular initiative for all concerned. But it has also proved to be a highly effective incentive for Hong Kong to become now the hub for international wine and beer trade in Asia. Over many decades, Hong Kong has been a particular, particularly familiar and lucrative hunting ground for UK companies in Asia. Both English and Chinese are official languages in Hong Kong, while with English being the predominant language of international business. Our common law system is based on the English system and underpinned by an independent judiciary. Hong Kong people cherish their personal and economic freedoms, including free flow of capital, ideas, and information, liberal immigration regime, as well as an unfettered media. All this has served Hong Kong well for many decades and continues to do so under the principle of one country, two systems. In the 16 years since Hong Kong's reunification with mainland China, our city has continued to be ranked the world's freest economy by both the Heritage Foundation and also the Fraser Institute. We are also recognized as the most competitive economy in Asia by the 2013 Institute of Management Development World Competitiveness Report. This seems good for Hong Kong, but in a fast-changing world, it is not good enough. To borrow a, the words of the late American businessman, Peter Drucker, standing still is the fastest way of moving backwards in a rapidly changing world, end quote. And nowhere is the business world changing faster than in Asia. We have the rapid growth of mainland China with its expanding middle class and increasingly urbanized population. We have some of the most exciting emerging economies, such as Thailand, such as Malaysia, as well as dynamic new markets with untapped potential, such as Myanmar, Cambodia, and hopefully soon, Laos. I would like to share with you some of the ways that Hong Kong is moving forward to capture the opportunities in our region, and we would like you to come and join the ride with us. First of all, we are expanding Hong Kong's capacity as an international business and financial center. <clears throat> to make room for more companies, we are now developing a whole new world-class central business district in the area of Kowloon East, which includes the site of our old Kai Tech Airport. This area will provide an additional 4 million square meters of office space which is actually double the amount of office space now available in Central. We are planning to expand the Hong Kong International Airport by building a third runway and supporting facilities to cope with future demand. Cross-boundary infrastructure projects under construction include a 29-kilometer bridge, Kum Tunnel Link, connecting Hong Kong to the western part of the Pearl River Delta and we are building the express rail link that will plug into the high-speed rail network in the mainland when it's completed in 2015, two years from now. These projects will expedite our connection to new markets in the mainland 
and make Hong Kong an even more efficient trade and logistics center. In terms of soft infrastructure, we have a unique free trade arrangement with China called SIPA. This arrangement is the only case in the world of a city having an arrangement with its own sovereign. It is made possible because Hong Kong and China are separate customs territories and separate members of the World Trade Organization under one country, two systems. SIPA is important because it gives preferential treatment for Hong Kong companies to access 50 services areas in the mainland. It also contains over 400 liberalization measures and provides Hong Kong-made products with tariff-free access to the mainland. The good news for foreign firms incorporated in Hong Kong is that they can all enjoy the full benefits of SIPA under our nationality neutral principle. These are just some of the reasons that almost 1,000 British firms have operations in Hong Kong, and more than half of these companies conduct their regional operations from our city. As China's global financial center, we have been at the forefront of the internationalization of the mainland currency, the renminbi. This is one of the most exciting developments for international finance today. Hong Kong is the chief offshore renminbi center with the largest pool of renminbi liquidity outside the mainland. In the first nine months of this year, <coughs> banks in Hong Kong, regardless of their nationality, handle about 80% of total offshore renminbi payments amounting to some three trillion renminbi. A strong focus of my trip on this occasion to London and Paris tomorrow this, uh, is to discuss ways for our cities to collaborate more closely on promoting the renminbi as an international currency. At the same time, we keep in close touch with the central government in Beijing to develop new renminbi denominated financial products for investors to, to ex expand their portfolios and finance their China operations using the renminbi. Other new initiatives for our financial services, including amending our tax laws to facilitate the development of Islamic finance in Hong Kong, particularly is the Islamic bonds, or what we call the sukut. We have also amended our trust laws, which will become effective on the 1st of December to develop the trust services industry in Hong Kong. And we shall also uh, launch an enhanced competency framework for our burgeoning private banking sector. These are just some of the ways that Hong Kong is moving forward amid Asia's rapidly changing business environment. Yet, it still is not good enough for us. To maintain our competitive edge as a truly international business and financial hub, we need to attract the best and brightest talents to come work in Hong Kong. We have great business opportunities, no doubt about it. But let's be honest, besides working hard, I know we still want to have a good time too. And Hong Kong can offer precisely that healthy balance that you seek. You will be able to find some of the best shopping areas, some of the best restaurants, mainly three Michelin star restaurants, as well as nightlife on this planet in Hong Kong. And at the same time, country parks and amusement parks are easily accessible where you can relax and enjoy the great outdoors. So ladies and gentlemen, I have mentioned a couple of the world rankings that highlight Hong Kong's strength as a free, open, and competitive environment for business. So it is probably only fair that I congratulate LBS on being ranked ahead of INSEAD <laughs> in the latest FT Global MBA rankings. Congratulations. I should also mention that I shall be returning to Hong Kong on Friday to do some accounting work of my own as I begin to prepare my budget for 2014-15 financial year. This will be my seventh budget, and I can assure you that creating more opportunities to do business in Hong Kong will be among the top priorities in my deliberations. So do take a fresh look at the exciting prospects in Hong Kong for business and financial professionals such as yourselves. And I hope that, uh, look, and I also look forward, and I hope that you will consider 
coming to Hong Kong, and I look forward to welcoming you to Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, if you wouldn't mind taking a few questions yes, from the audience, uh, uh, would be delighted. You're welcome to sit No, no, I'll stay. Okay. 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 <laughs> um, now, first of all, um, thank you for those, uh, those words, uh, in particular about your desire to bring the best and brightest to Hong Kong. Quite a refreshing uh, tone coming from a government official when from a government official when so many countries have tried to cut down on immigration, uh, uh, among other things. Um, now, I, I just have one question before we open it up to the group as a whole. Uh, if you were uh, if you were advising a young person coming looking to Hong Kong, um, we all know about the strengths of Hong Kong in finance, um, all the uh, business and real estate, trade, and so on. What area would you emphasizes particularly promising for a young person pursuing business? Um, financial services certainly is one key area. Uh, financial services take up 16% of our GDP with only 6% of our working population. Mm -hmm. So it's a really high value added area. That's a big area. Trade and logistics is a big area. Particularly, I'm sure you'll be studying things such as supply chain management. This is one big key area in Hong Kong. About close to 95% of Hong Kong's GDP is services. So we have hardly any manufacturing, not to mention that we buy everything that we eat. We don't grow much. Uh, so, and, but in, instead of having our own manufacturing in Hong Kong, we manage manufacturing around the world. Especially now, not any one single country do it, make a product from beginning to end. It's always a supply chain. You probably have to go through half a dozen countries before you finish a product. So in Hong Kong, we have companies such as company like Li and Fong that does nothing else but manage thousands of factories around the world. So it's basically it's, it's, a, it's a huge computer. Uh, and it, it does exactly that. So we look for people who would do trading, uh, do, lo do logistics, do trade servicing. We also look for uh, professionals in accounting, in finance, banking. I mentioned about private banking. It's becoming a, a very big business in Hong Kong. And uh, it's because of the tax situation in Hong Kong, we find a lot of wealthy people with a lot of capital from around our region, from India, from China, Malaysia, Indonesia, coming to Hong Kong, looking for asset managers. And these are also growth areas. So all of these, everything else is would be welcome. OK. And what about entrepreneurs? Is that um, <coughs> in, 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 besides in those areas, or are there other areas as well where entrepreneurial opportunities seem particularly right? Uh, entrepreneurs, we welcome. Uh, it's probably one of the easiest places to set up a company, and you can operate within hours. Uh, and just have, with a good idea, it will sell. Uh, creative industries is, is, a, is a big growing industry in Hong Kong. Uh, if you're interested in, in the entertainment industry, uh, movies, films, a lot of contents. I think contents is what something that we will need in, in the future, and this is something that, that, that would be uh, truly wanted. Great, sounds like it, it runs the whole gamut. Thank you very much. Uh, now, you can, clearly the Hong Kong brand is strong here on campus. I, I can't remember the last time we had a, a dignitary visiting and we were standing room only, so I won't ask very many more, any more questions. I'll, I'll let the um, floor open to the, uh, leave the floor open to the group here. So if you could please uh, um, uh, ask a question, please raise your hand, identify yourself, um, and direct the question uh, to Mr. Sen. Yes, uh, uh, and the back there. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Lance Sto, and uh, first year MBA students here. Uh, thank you so much for coming to LBS and giving us a speech. And all your busy time. Thank you. Uh, I actually have a really uh, specific question in regards to the investment banking industry, which you haven't really touched on so far, I guess. So uh, the Chinese government last week just uh, released a new regime uh, policy reform change. And uh, the uh, signal that they're going to uh, lose regulation on capital markets, especially in IPO, 
have uh, from. Um, I think the, this change may bring a uh, Shanghai change and Hong Kong stock change uh, competition head to head. So I guess from your point of view, what, what kind of challenge and opportunities the new uh, government brings to, uh, to Hong Kong business? Thank you so much. Every time, every opportunity that China opens up a little bit more, we welcome it. Uh, there is no place on earth that is better prepared for the opening of China. Hong Kong, in fact, is the biggest investor in China right now. It's the biggest investor in every single province in China. So Hong Kong's business network in China is unmatched. Uh, nobody else in this world, in terms of a mass of people, understands the China market better than the people in Hong Kong. And I have always, I would go to a lot of different countries and talk to the finance ministers, the trade ministers, and said, for the small and medium-sized enterprises in, in any of this country who want to do business in Asia or do business in the mainland, do come to Hong Kong. Because small and medium-sized enterprises, they don't have a second chance. They have enough capital to invest once. If they fail that once, they don't have a second chance. So, but when they come to Hong Kong, they can make use of the expertise that we have in Hong Kong. They can hire professionals or partner with people who have a better understanding of the business environment in, in the mainland, and they can use that. And it doesn't mean that they would be a successful 100% of the time, but the chances of finding success is much greater. So we, we do encourage that. So in terms of China opening up further, we, we welcome it. And we grow up in competition. We don't worry about that. Uh, so, and, and I think if th th there's more competition in China, from, or coming from China, we, all we would be doing would be creating a much bigger pie for the, for the whole world. Thank you for that question. Hello, Mr. Zhang, and very nice meeting you here. I came from Hong Kong. I was born in Hong Kong, raised up in Hong Kong, educated in Hong Kong, and came here two years ago, three years ago. Yeah. And I had no chance to meet you in Hong Kong, so. <laughs> so thanks to LBS. I have two questions. The first one um, to answer a little bit about that. How do you compare Hong Kong with Shanghai and Singapore? Okay, here is the first question. And the second question I ask on behalf of my friend, because she just WhatsApp me two hours ago. <laughs> um, she has a kid, five years old, and um, he asked me whether it's good for, he, for her to send her kid to study in the UK or in Hong Kong. Because you are talking about attracting talents to Hong Kong. So how about growing your talents in Hong Kong? Yeah, I would like, I would like to answer your uh, Hear your answer. Answer my friend. Thank you very much. Uh, first question, uh, Hong Kong compared with Shanghai, Singapore, some people even ask about Shenzhen, Seoul, and it's really f in interesting that all these words start with S. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I always call this, I group them all as the, all these are the S word places. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, we, People think that this would be competition uh, in a way. But in Hong Kong, we, we never want to monopolize anything. Even in terms of renminbi, we have been designated by Beijing as the international financial center. But we don't want to monopolize because our, our purpose is very, very clear. Our purpose is to internationalize the renminbi. So we've been working, we've been taking the initiative, we've been aggressive in connecting with different capitals, including London. We have an annual forum with London to, to try to expand the renminbi business. I'm going to Paris tomorrow, uh, working with Europlus in, in promoting uh, the, the renminbi. I go to Singapore, Shanghai, and, and so forth. So these are, we look at them as partners. We don't see them as, as, as competitors. And what we are doing is working together, growing the pie bigger. The slice may be smaller, but still a much bigger slice than what it would have been. So that, that, that is important. As for uh, a five-year-old child where they want to, to be raised, I think that part would be a personal choice. 
Uh, I went to secondary school in New York. Uh, I went to college in, in Massachusetts. It, it's the choice. It, it, there, there are, and if you are in a position to make a choice, make the choice. You know, the choice is important. It's more important than any, anything else in the world. And if you have that choice, make it. But do it wisely. So you make a very right choice. You study at MIT and Harvard. It's expensive. Question here. Good afternoon. I'm Hilary Moriarty, the National Director of the Boarding Schools Association. Mm. And extremely grateful to the number of Hong Kong students um, who have come from Hong Kong to British boarding schools. I'm interested now in what are you doing to try to make a university education in Hong Kong, be it at undergraduate or postgraduate level, more attractive to British students. The brightest and the best could go there for the 21st century as easily as go to Yale or Harvard. What are you doing to make it more attractive? Uh, uh, education is is the biggest single item in my spending every year. It's, it's over 20% of my total spending each year, and it's more than anything else. Uh, and so it is very important that we, we do that properly. I mean, Hong Kong education is basically free, uh, from a, a elementary school all the way up. Now we are starting working on, on preschool. Uh, we have a, a coupon system for parents to choose the kindergarten that they go to, but we are gradually working to, to sort of improve the curriculum, uh, to talk to, to work on teacher training and so forth, so that we can get to preschool as well. Because we truly believe that education is, is the greatest equalizer, and it is the best thing to prevent uh, cross-generational poverty. And so we want to, 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 to do that properly. And in our universities, what we want to do is to expose our students more to a more international environment. Because globalization is here with us, and it's not going to go away. And people need to be exposed to an international environment where they can deal with different people. Uh, but in a glo globalized world, it means more competition. It means a lot more competition. And in our universities now, we have a quota of up to 20% of each university's intake could be students not from Hong Kong. It's important that, that we set a quota because the, the, the expenditure that, that we use comes from tax money of the local population and they, and they always uh, are giving a, pr a priority to the others. But even with the 20%, we, we try to expose more uh, to, to others. But we also want to build in some uh, exchange programs with different schools so that there would be that, that exposure and that would be very important for our students as well as for other students who may develop a liking uh, for Hong Kong and decide to stay in Hong Kong and that would be the kind of talent that, that we look forward to. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for coming, Mr. Secretary. Um, my name is Henry. I'm from the Master of Finance course at LBS. I've got a question about the, the Hong Kong currency. Right now, the Hong Kong dollar is pegged with the US dollars, as it has been for about 30 years. Um, given that CPI in Hong Kong is about 4.6%, and we just come off significantly from the 7% a year ago, um, why are we still pegging our money with the US dollars, given that their CPI is 1%? So shouldn't we start having our own rates where uh, we should start designing our rates or we start following our MB, given that the, the head of Hong Kong monetary committee gets paid more than the Nike? So shouldn't we start actually designing our own rates or why are we still following the US? The head of the monetary authorities not only get paid more than Ben Bernanke, he gets paid more than me. <laughs> <laughs> but this it shows because we want to get the right people, get the, the best people for the job, and we, we are, we're not worried about you know how much. They should get paid what they deserve, and it is a very important position. Talking about the PEC, we have, we've been PEC to the US dollar since 1983, and we just celebrated the 30th anniversary. 
uh, recently. Uh, I said celebrated because since 1983, we have gone through, I don't know, I can't even remember how many ups and downs, huge ups and downs. And we have gone through that, coming out of it even stronger. In many ways, why are we linked to the US dollar? The Hong Kong economic cycle is a lot closer to the United States economy than other. Some people have suggested the mainland, but look at the per capita GDP. Hong Kong is about 36, 37,000 US dollars now. China perhaps five or, or six. It's the big discrepancy. So the economic cycles are quite different. And moreover, the renminbi is not even a converted, convertible currency. So there, there, there's a lot, a, lot, a lot of differences. And in, uh, you, you, you talked about you know, the, the, the CPI rate. Uh, there's always both two sides to the coin. A lot of people depreciate the currency to become more competitive. So it's good for the export. Hong Kong is a very big export country. Even though we don't make a lot of things, we do a lot of re-export. And it's, it's important that, that we do that. Uh, and on, on the other hand, so that the competitiveness is, is an important thing. But buying, well, in terms of pur purchasing things, it would be a little bit more expensive when, when your currency is weaker. So this is the cost that, that, that we have to pay. So we, we need to find a, a proper balance in, proper balance in, in, in that. Uh, and after all now, most of the businessmen in Hong Kong still settle their bills in US dollar. And that creates the, con the, the, the confidence that they have. But is more importantly, for any one of the currency, confidence is important. Uh, once you start changing the, the rates, uh, to, to, to meet short-term needs, you create problems for yourself. So we have lo lo looked at this situation for, for the last 30 years. And I always tell people, people ask me, well, why don't you review it? I said, I do it every day. I lo look at it very, very closely. And we have always come to the same conclusion, that we have no intention to change it, and we don't see any need to change it. Inflation is not high in Hong Kong, it's 4%. Your target. We don't have a target, but 4% is, I think, is acceptable. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. I think, yes. Hi, um, my name is Chan, I'm a BA student first year. Um, I was wondering, given the kind of limited space in Hong Kong, coupled with the uh, expansion plans that you were just talking about, where do you see the need for you know, infrastructure and public space investment over the next five, 10, 15 years? You know, what are the needs and challenges in that, in that space? Mm. Uh, the whole of Hong Kong is 1,000 square kilometers. Not huge. Uh, but the way that we have been u u using space in Hong Kong is quite different from a lot of other countries. We we were built on a sort of a, a very dense environment. So only about 20% of Hong Kong is built up. We leave about 40% as country parks, untouched. And we, we still have a lot, lot of areas left. Uh, and and we, we are now uh, planning to re reclaim some of the islands, some, some of the, the seabed uh, outside of the Victoria Harbor to build new land. Uh, and so I think that, that would, when, once we have uh, completed doing that, it would take us well in, into the future. We have seven million people now. Uh, we expect to grow to about eight and a half in about 25 years or so. Uh, so I think it, it's manageable uh, in, in, in that, but what, what we need is to and in Hong Kong, we don't encourage people to, uh, to, to, to use their own cars. So we have to build up our public transportation sector uh, in a strong way uh, to, to connect. So using the, the mass rail transport is a very important thing. And what we usually call the MTRC model, which is our, our ma mass transit rail, uh, is an important aspect of it that we grow the urban centers on top of the stations. 
Uh, and so that provides convenience as well as ready customers uh, for our rail system as well. So a lot of that we will try, try to manage. Hi, um, um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my name is Dr. Stuart Bassett, and I'm a University Lecturer in Social Policy at the University of Oxford. Um, and also, I work on a uh, RGC funded project uh, with Hong Kong U on defining uh, population policy for Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I'm afraid I'm asking a unambiguous question. Sorry, I don't mind our attending social policy. Um, I guess I just wanted to ask um, at the start of your talk, we were very positive about low tax rates in Hong Kong and, and pushing down tax rates to be competitive in the business world, well, which of course is completely understandable. But do you think that in doing so, um, that actually can prevent the government from addressing some of the pressing social and economic um, issues and difficulties in Hong Kong? For example, surrounding uh, population and population aging and, and poverty and uh, intergenerational yeah, uh, I think what is difficult to define is enough. What is enough? Uh, since I became financial secretary in 2007, uh, my expenditure has increased from about 200 billion to close to 400 billion. In seven years, each year growing in double digits. Uh, perhaps not, not, not enough, it's hard to say, uh, but you know, th th there's a limit of, of how, where we can go. At this, at this point, a lot of people don't realize that, that half of our population in Hong Kong live in subsidized housing, very low rent, all subsidized. That is one way. Free education, basically. Free medical health. People uh, get into a hospital with some kind of needing some kind of op operation. We charge them for the three meals, basically, and nothing else. So it's basically free medical. And we also have a pretty, pretty strong safety net that takes up about 17% of my yearly expenditure. Is that enough? I think it's, it's a judgmental thing. Uh, so, but I think we, we need to manage. We hope that we will be able to have enough resources to improve people's living year to year. Uh, and since 2007, since I became financial secretary, I've been increasing the expenditure, but every year I, I still manage to have a surplus. And so up to now, we, we have accumulated a pretty good size reserve. And I think we need that kind of reserve to deal with the future. As, as you know, in Hong Kong, the the, the population is aging quickly, uh, and you know, in a couple of decades, we're gonna see a lot more elderly people vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, working population. So, so we, we, we're gonna need some resources to, to deal with this sort of uh, situation in, in the future. And, 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 and I, I want to start preparing for that. Yes. Hi, um, <coughs> I'm a politics student from the University of Warwick. Um, at the end of your speech, you mentioned the creative industry in Hong Kong. Um, as we know, um, the creative industry in the UK contributes a lot to the British economy. But in Asia, we face strong competitors from like Taiwan, Japan and South Korea. So as a government, how can we support the development of that industry? Mm. I think we we'll always have to begin with a mindset. Uh, we, we, we encourage uh, uh, creativity uh, in, in Hong Kong. Uh, and so we, we pro provide different facilities, we provide different opportunities, and also some funding uh, for people to try out diff different things. Uh, I don't think creativity is something that you can nurture in, in, in universities. Uh, it is, it's really something that, that grows out of the environment. Uh, so, and I think the opportunity for, for people to, uh, to try different things. And so we, we try to nurture an environment uh, that would be able to, to provide people with the opportunities of uh, being creative and, and, and so forth. 
as you can see in, in Hong Kong, our film ministry is, is a pretty, 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 pretty good one uh, that, that makes quite a bit of money. And, and coming up in Hong Kong, we are going into the, what we call the business of design week. And that, that has been a sort of a major, a, a major uh, seminar that takes place every year in Hong Kong and it's becoming a, uh, a, a big feature in all the designers' calendar. So we, we, are, we are growing on that. But I think very importantly, all these things needs, creativity need, needs to combine with a business side. Uh, there gotta be uh, some business ramifications for that, some ways of ma making some return, making some money uh, out of that creativity. And we are always try to find a, a proper balance uh, be, be between the, the two perspectives. Um, last question, please. Yes. Uh, thank, you. thank you for your inspiring talk. And I'm fortunate to have working experience for the Express Rail Link and the Quintana Extension Project, as you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, as you mentioned, that Hong Kong is uh, traditionally strong in business areas such as financial uh, finance services and trading and the logistics and the managing manufacturers. So uh, how do you see the future development of Hong Kong's economic structure? Uh, do you see any um, uh, new business areas that Hong Kong wants to emphasize in the next few decades? Thank you. I think the current formula works for us. What we need to do is to enhance our strength right, right now. Uh, Co compete on, on our advantages. So the, the, what we call the four basic, the pillar industries that we have, uh, financial services, tourism, uh, professional services, as well as logistics and trading, we need to enhance that further mm -hmm. uh, because th those are our strength. But meanwhile, we're also looking at new growth industries. Creative industry is one. We're looking at the certification Certification is, is a big area that, that we will be good at because you know, we, it's a, we were a place that governed by the rule of law and so there's a lot more confidence, a lot more faith in terms of the certifications that we have. So a lot of uh, toys, for example, or medicine, uh, we, we would go through a, a certification that, that, we, that we do in Hong Kong. So these are some of the things that we would do as we'll be exploring uh, new opportunities, new industries, so that we, we can grow that even further in, in, in the future years. But most importantly is we got to reinforce what we have right now, strengthen the pillar industries that we have, and hopefully uh, that will work to our advantage in the future. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you're clearly an optimist uh, about Hong Kong. You've clearly given a lot of thought to the future of Hong Kong. You pointed out uh, all of the incredible changes that are happening, both in Asia, uh, but also more broadly, uh, the world around in Hong Kong's place. Now, on, on a personal level, as you look to the, say, next year or so, what do you expect will be your priorities to ensure that uh, Hong Kong remains at the forefront? Uh, I mean, what sorts of actions do you expect to take yourself uh, uh, that will help strengthen Hong Kong? I think most importantly, I want to stay healthy. I think that would be very important, <laughs> not just for me, but for everybody. <laughs> is that? That's it. <laughs> <laughs>